Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Naomi Parker Fraley, who died recently at the age of 96, and all the obits are calling her the real Rosie the Riveter. I don't want to throw any cold water on that, but Naomi Parker Fraley was a Rosie the Riveter, but she wasn't the Rosie the Riveter because there was no the Rosie the Riveter. In 2015, we did the podcast on Mary Doyle Keefe, where we discussed the origins of Rosie the Riveter, and there's actually not one Rosie the Riveter because it's a sort of a concept. In 1941, there was a picture of a pretty young woman in a bandana and overalls working at a lathe in an Alameda, California Naval Air Station. For years, that woman was thought to be a Michigan woman, Geraldine Hoff Doyle, and she was thought to be the inspiration for the image created by J. Howard Miller in 1942 of a woman in a bandana flexing her muscle. And that's what most people think of today when they think of Rosie the Riveter. Okay, so after many years, we've pretty conclusively ascertained that that woman in the Alameda Naval Air Station was not Geraldine Huff Doyle, but Naomi Parker Fraley. So why isn't she and not Geraldine Huff Doyle the real Rosie the Riveter? Well, I can't speak for Geraldine Huff Doyle. And Naomi Parker Fraley definitely does get some credit as a Rosie the Riveter, but there's no proof that she was the model for J. Howard Miller's familiar image. And it was in 1943 that the famous song Rosie the Riveter came out. And that's where the concept of Rosie the Riveter actually became an American icon. And the model for that song may have been any number of women. It could have been Veronica Foster, Canada's poster girl for women in the war. It could have been Rosalind P. Walter, or it could have been Rose Will Monroe, who worked in an Ypsilanti, Michigan aircraft factory. And she went on to do some promotional tours as Rosie. Here are the four vagabonds doing the best version of the Rosie the Riveter song. And I don't think we'll ever know exactly who was the model for this song. <laughs> All right, so you've got all those people. And don't forget Mary Doyle Keefe, whose podcast we did in 2015. I refer you to that. And she was a dental hygienist. But we can conclusively say that she was the model for Norman Rockwell's Saturday Evening Post cover, where he shows her as a Michelangelo Sistine Chapel figure with a rivet gun on her lap, an American flag in the background, and a copy of Mein Kampf underneath her feet. And it's titled Rosie the Riveter. So it's hard to keep Mary Doyle Keefe out of the picture as a Rosie the Riveter as well. So I'm going to leave it at... Naomi Parker Fraley was a Rosie the Riveter. She might have been the inspiration for the first Rosie the Riveter, but she was certainly not the Rosie the Riveter. But we'll take note of her anyway. We're going to move on now to Ingvar Kamprad, who died recently at the age of 91. He was the founder of the Swedish furniture chain IKEA. He started the company in 1943, and there are currently 389 stores worldwide. The name Ikea comes from Mr. Conrad's initials, I.K., together with the name of the farm he grew up on in Elmterid and the nearby village Agunarid. The company's retail sales in 2016 totaled $43 billion, and its flat-pack furniture became iconic for both its affordability and for its picture-based assembly instructions. According to the BBC, Mr. Conrad came up with the idea when he was 17 years old, and he came up with the idea of flat pack furniture after watching an employee remove the legs from a table in order to fit it into a customer's car. Furniture designer Jeff Banks said that Mr. Comprad's creations radically changed how people made and designed products for the home. People have tried to reproduce and copy that, but unsuccessfully, Mr. Banks said, and he added that the designs produced and sold through the retailer made good use of recyclable products, adding that Mr. Comprad was head and shoulders above the rest. Mr. Comprad said that he founded the company with some money his father had given him as a gift for performing well at school despite his dyslexia. He was known for his devotion to frugality, reportedly driving an old Volvo and traveling by economy class. He once said that it was in the nature of his homeland to be thrifty. If you look at me now, 
I don't think I'm wearing anything that wasn't bought at a flea market. In an interview in the 1980s, he said that his vision for IKEA was that it would be a company that would make life easier for its customers. IKEA has remained privately owned under a Dutch trust operated by the Comprat family. Its complex business structure has drawn controversy, and the European Commission said last year that it launched an investigation into IKEA's tax arrangements. The European Green Party said the arrangement allowed the company to avoid paying a large sum of taxes between 2009 and 2014, but a spokesman for Dutch-based Interkia, one of the company's two divisions, said that the company had been taxed in accordance with EU rules. As with most entrepreneurs, there's another dark cloud in Mr. Comprad's history. He had faced scrutiny over his past links to Nazi groups. He revealed some elements of his past in a book in 1988, admitting that he was a close friend of the Swedish fascist activist Per Engdahl and a member of the new Swedish movement between 1942 and 1945 when he was a teenager. He said that his involvement was youthful stupidity and the greatest mistake of his life. But a 2011 book by Elizabeth Asprink alleged details beyond what Mr. Comprad had previously admitted. She wrote that he was an active recruiter for a Swedish Nazi group and stay close to sympathizers well after World War II. At the time, a spokesman for Mr. Comprad said that he had long admitted flirting with fascism, but there were now no Nazi sympathizing thoughts in Ingvar's head whatsoever. His company does make nice furniture, so I'll leave it to you whether we should give him a pass on the stuff that happened when he was a young man. We're going to move on now to Ursula Le Guin, who died recently at the age of 88. She was one of the foremost female science fiction writers in the world. Here is the BBC Four last word with Matthew Bannister for a brief discussion of Ursula Le Guin. Ursula K. Le Guin was the popular and influential author of many works of science fiction and fantasy. Her books, including the Earthsea Trilogy, were translated into 40 languages and sold millions of copies. She was born Ursula Kroeber, the daughter of two anthropologists. Ursula graduated from Radcliffe College in 1951, then won a Fulbright scholarship to study in Paris, where she met her husband, Charles Le Guin. Judith Adams is in the process of dramatising all Ursula's works for Radio 4. When she first read the Earthsea books, she was entranced by the imaginary setting. The world of Earthsea is a world of water. One vast ocean, dotted with islands big and small, populous and barren, welcoming and warlike. There's a set of islands, and at the heart of the islands, we first find out, is a place called Roke. There's a school of Roke where the wizards are trained, not, of course, unlike um, with J.K. Rowling's books. And um, they're all male and the story is all male, and the hero is male but uh, flawed, and interestingly flawed. There's a whole branch of magic, after all, in, in many, many cultures, which is naming magic. If you know the true name of the thing, you have power over the thing or the person. That's the basic magic I used in Earthsea. If you look at the list of people who were influenced by her, which I um, mean, I have one here, which is like, um, there's George Martin, but there's, there's David Mitchell, China Miedel, there's Ian Banks, there's Terry Pratchett, there's J.K. Rowling, there's Salman Rushdie. Why do all women writers get forgotten extremely quickly? That's a real anxiety, but simply from watching what happens to women writers. They go much faster than men writers do. It's, you know, there's this kind of wish to get the women out of the way. We're going to move on to our feature now, Mort Walker, who died recently at the age of 94. He was one of America's foremost cartoonists. He did the cartoon strip High and Lois for the newspapers, the cartoon strip Boner's Ark, but his magnum opus was Beetle Bailey, which he started drawing in 1950 and continued drawing till his death, making it the longest-running comic strip drawn by the same person. He did have some help from his kids later in life. And Beetle Bailey, while it's not as popular today, it's sort of fallen off, was once very popular in the 50s and 60s. It's about an army outfit with all sorts of characters, and Mort Walker drew on his own army experience. Here he talks about it. My name is Addison Morton Walker. Back in Missouri, everybody had to have three names. Until all of a sudden, my mother said, oh, that's too much to call one little boy. <laughs> you know? So they flipped a coin and I became Morton Walker. And then when I got to be a cartoonist, and even that was too long. So I am now Mort Walker. My father used to send me down on Sunday morning to get the comic section. I'd bring him up in bed. And I'd get in bed with him, he'd put his arms around me, and he'd read me the comics. And he'd laugh till tears came down his cheeks. And I'd lie there in his arms and look up, and I'd say, isn't that great to do that for somebody, make him so happy, you know? 
Here I am, almost 90 years old, and still doing it and, and enjoying it. Over 60 years of doing Beetle Bailey, the longest running strip in the history of the comics done by the same person. Then the Army got hold of me. I graduated from Officer's Candidate School as a second lieutenant. They sent me to Italy. All the soldiers and the officers that I worked with are all in there. Everybody in the strip is based on a real person. I like to get people to, to like soldiers <laughs> and for soldiers to like the Army. I feel so sorry for the, the veterans that, that have that post-traumatic stress. I would do anything to help them, even one, even one, if I could. If you can make somebody happy, boy, I tell you, that cures all kinds of problems that people have. It's my business, in a way, and I enjoy that part of it. He was also an avid comic strip collector and helped organize a museum that had some financial problems, but it's now been transferred to Ohio State University, and here he talks about that. And I always thought they were great art, but when I came to New York, I found out that people were throwing them away. I used to rescue cartoons out of wastebaskets. They used to put them out on the tables and let people just take them, just to get rid of them, because they, they just cluttered up their storage rooms. Mort Walker is in the paper every day, yet most people don't know his story. He's the author of the comic strip Beetle Bailey and has fought since the 1940s to create a national cartoon museum, a shrine to the medium he's devoted his life to. You know, they sell these things for an awful lot of money. We never really got into selling them, just, just collecting. It's the largest cartoon treasure trove of its kind in the world and is estimated to be worth over $20 million dollars. Since 1974, the collection has moved four times. It has been sitting here in a storage facility in Stamford, Connecticut since 2002. The walkers are now packing the tunes up and shipping them to Ohio State University. The museum's collection will there join forces with the university's library and eventually will be available for public view. They take these comic strip characters, or the, or the animated characters, and they become so fond of them, they're like friends. Recently, I had a thing with Beetle Bailey. <clears throat> I had all the guys getting mail at mail call, except Sarge didn't get anything. And they said, Sarge, poor Sarge, you didn't get any mail. Sarge, oh, who wants mail? You got hell on mail. I don't want any mail. And he goes back in the, <laughs> in the barracks, and the big tear comes down of his eyes. I got letters from kids all over the country saying, Sarge, don't cry. Here's a letter for you. Hope it makes you happy. <laughs> Through the decades, the museum has struggled to maintain funding, but Mr. Walker has stayed behind the cause tirelessly. Well, it's interesting. You know, somebody said, why, why do you have to have a museum? I've already seen your cartoon in the paper. I said, have you ever seen a picture of the Mona Lisa? Why would you ever go to the Louvre? I think that people get a kick out of seeing the cartoons because oftentimes they laugh again or uh, they relate to it almost like a person. The line between Mr. Walker's comics and his life is blurred. His home is a monument to cartoons. From here, he continues to draw six strips and a Sunday spread every week of Beetle Bailey. The strip, which he now co-bylines with his oldest son, Greg, is in its 58th year of continuous publication. I guess cartoons are something that you read and throw away. Sometimes people clip them out and put them on the cash register or the bullet board or something like that. And I've always said, I don't care about the... Pulitzer Prize. I want the bullet board prize. <laughs> That's where it really matters. With the museum moving and his 85th birthday approaching, some might wonder if Mr. Walker has any desire to slow down. And then I have another 100,000 of the written ideas that I, I didn't sketch out. You got a lot left over. The real gold mine. A laugh mine, you might say. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. And to honor Mort Walker, we're going to play the Beetle Bailey theme from the 1960s cartoon. The cartoon wasn't too good, although it did have Howard Morris as Beetle Bailey. But I've seen that Jay Livingston and Ray Evans had something to do with it in their top of the line. In fact, we've closed with a bunch of their songs. We've closed with the Mr. Ed theme. We've closed with Tammy. I think we've closed with Buttons and Bows. And we've certainly played the Bonanza theme. As I said, top of the line. So for Mort Walker, here's the Beetle Bailey theme. He's a military hero of the nation. Though he doesn't always follow regulations. At the sound of remedy, he is here for you to see. And we know you laugh with Private Beetle Bailey. Beetle Bailey. That's the general, colonel, major, and the captain. The lieutenant and the sergeant and the corporal. They will tell you with a shout. They would gladly live without a certain private by the name of Beetle Bailey. Beetle Bailey.
Needle Bailey.